last time. And since it's always good to repeat things, and since I don't remember exactly where we were when I stopped, let me just review what we've got. H, interaction of X and G, psi bar, psi phi. We have the diagrams, which I wrote essentially backwards in the notes. P1, X1, P2 prime, P2, P1 prime, X2. So this was S2, and S1 was P1. This again was X2, P2, P2 prime, P1 prime. Okay, so this is how we wrote these Feynman diagrams. And I should maybe remind you, psi alpha plus of X is integral of DQ of P to psi Q, root to EP, sum on two spin values up and down, A of P and S, U alpha of P and S. Right. E to the minus psi PX. Psi minus, say, alpha of X is the same thing. DQ of P to psi Q, root to EP. But now it's sum on this. The antiparticle of momentum P, spin polarization S, V alpha S of P, E to the I PX. And actually I want to write it this way, U sub alpha S. And then the psi bars are psi bar plus alpha S. Let me just write it like that. B of P and S, V bar S alpha of P minus psi PX. And psi bar minus of X is again DQ of P and we'll just leave that aside. Sum A PS of X, charge of U bar S alpha P E to the I. All right, so those are our expansions. Another question? Yeah. For the zero spin case, we had the propagator for the uncharged field. That's the thing we did in class. And the one for the charged field, is that the same? Well, yeah. And is it always the case that it's independent of the charge? It's just... Yeah. What you do is you have a 1 over square root of 2. And so that's why it comes out. I don't understand that. What do you mean the 1 over square root of 2? All right, well, let's see. You're talking about the mean value in the vacuum for the time-ordered product. 
And if you're talking about a charged field as opposed to an uncharged field, then um, you might have um, phi of, uh, of x and psi of y, and it might look like this thing. Then this is actually vacuum time ordered product 1 over root 2 phi 1 plus i phi 2 1 over root 2 phi 1 minus i phi 2. Okay? And um, the cross products, phi 1 with phi 2, are going to be 0 because this will annihilate or create a particle 1, this will annihilate or create a right. particle 2, so they're not going to. All right. So we get a 1 half phi 1, phi 1 plus 1 half phi 2, phi 2. So that's why it comes out to be the same. All right, now, we did some, we did a lot of work on uh, spinners and the Lorentz group and so forth, and we learned that u u bar was p slash plus m, v of p, v bar of p was p slash minus m, and um, we were then computing this um, matrix element, and we had that s was minus a half g squared, square root of two e, uh, vacuum a of t1 prime s1 prime, c of t2 prime, integral, time order power of two Hamiltonians, uh, c of p2 dagger, k dagger, p1 s1. So that's what we uh, started with. We assumed, we canceled the factor of 2 by assuming that the boson was annihilated at x2. And let's see, I think I should pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, We then found that S1 was minus e squared square root two e's over two e p two two e p two prime vacuum a of p one s one prime, and we had time order product uh, psi bar minus x one psi x one psi bar x two psi plus x two uh, e v i p two times one minus i p two x two e four x one e four x two a minus p one s one i can and the other term x two was basically the same, but in here we had t of psi bar x1 psi plus x1 psi bar minus x2 psi x2 and then ditto. Okay, so the idea here was that at in S1 the fermion was stopped at x2 and uh, in S2, it was stopped at X1. And so the psi plus is at X2 in, the, in S1, and the psi plus is at X1 here. And then um, 
the key thing was that if, if we look at this term, A of T1 prime, S1 prime, T of psi bar minus X1, I'm doing S, the S1 term now, actually, I owe you a piece of candy for the question. You asked a question. Me? Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah, you said you didn't understand such a thing. No, that was my guess. No. No, you said that. You added that. Oh, that's right. I said it was a one over square. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I just... Okay, anyway. So, to start with, this one cancels this one, and so we just have this, psi bar X2, psi X1, psi bar minus X1, T. And I'm going to leave out everything except the, I'm going to leave out the phase factors and so forth and the square roots. And it looks like this. Well, I may have left out a little too much. Right. No, this is okay. All right. So, this thing looks like vacuum A, theta X1, 0, minus X2, 0. We have psi bar minus X1, psi of X1, psi bar X2, plus theta X2, 0, minus X1, 0, psi bar X2, psi bar minus, I should have expanded the time on the product earlier, but anyway. Let's just look at it like this. And so now, what you see is that this term couples with this directly, but now this creation operator has to go through one turning field, you get an anti-commutator, so you get a minus on it. And so what you need is to define the time-ordered product, and this is what's simply done, is that the time-ordered product of, say, psi beta of X1, psi bar alpha of X2, is defined as theta of X1, 0, minus X2, 0, psi beta X1, psi bar alpha X2, minus the reverse order. And so you put in this minus sign to cope with the fact that this gets an extra minus sign there. And with this definition, then what we had was that S1 was, by this time, all the square roots canceled, and we got U bar of P prime S1 prime beta back to the time-ordered product, psi beta X1, psi bar alpha X2, back to, and then there was U alpha S1 of P1, and then there was this phase back to the X1, P1 prime plus P2 prime minus I X2, P1 plus P2, P2 of X1, P4, X2. So that was for S1, and S1 
once again into the diagram here. So you have P1 plus P2. So this line effectively carries P1 plus P2. And then we saw that, I'm not sure how far we got last time, but I think we saw that dealing with this, what one had then for S2, we had vacuum A of P1 prime, S1 prime, time order product psi bar, X1 psi plus X1 psi bar minus X2 psi X2 A dagger P1 plus one vacuum. So this is the key term there. Because it's S2, we said that for the S2, we stopped the fermion at X1 rather than where we stopped the boson, which is X2. And so this, of course, is vacuum A of P1 prime, S1 prime. And I'm going to write it differently this time than the two orders. I'm going to expand the time order product now. And so we have psi bar X1 psi plus X1 psi bar minus X2 psi X2 plus theta X2 zero minus X1 zero. Now the opposite order, psi bar minus X2 psi X2 psi bar X1 psi plus X1. And then A dagger P1 S1. OK. So now we move this across to stop the creation operator, cancel the creation operator, cross its two fermion operators. So that's a plus sign. Doesn't cross anything. Again, a plus sign. So what we have then is simply U alpha S1 of P1, U minus I P1 X1 over square root of 2 E P1. And then what's left is vacuum A P1 prime S1 prime. So I'm doing this in a little more detail. Theta X1 zero minus X2 zero. Psi bar alpha X1 psi bar minus X2 psi X2 plus theta X2 zero minus X1 zero psi bar minus X2 psi X2 psi bar alpha X1. OK. So we're down to here now. Here the minus sign is going to creep in again. We see now you get the minus sign when this creation operator cancels this annihilation operator. You get one minus sign here. Whereas over here, the creation operator is standing to the left of all the fields. And so there isn't any extra creation operator. And so if you define the time order product in the same way, then what you get is that this is U bar S1 prime theta P1 prime. Let me see. Yeah, OK. Vacuum time order product now. Psi theta X2 psi bar alpha X1 vacuum. And then U alpha S1 P1. And then E to the minus I P1 X1 plus I P1 prime X2 over the square root of the two E ones. So that's what we get. And 
this U bar comes from the expansion of sidebar minus in these two cases. All right, is that is that all okay? So the minus sign that comes from this term. All right, and the the upshot is that well, there. In fact, I think. In fact, if I just if I just use this, I can say that S two, in fact, is minus. In fact, just minus G squared. All this times an integral of this. Oh, and then there's one more. All right, all the all the two E's cancel then because we've already had. Anyway, the two E's are all gone. Let me just say that. And the space factor then, when we're all done here, is minus I X one P one minus P two prime minus I X two P two minus P one prime P four X one. Okay, so this this is the point Q for X for S two. And now we want to evaluate this time on the product. And so I'm going to get X one and say sine alpha bar X two. And then by definition, it's vacuum beta X one zero minus X two zero sine beta plus whoops sine beta X one sine bar alpha X two minus beta X two zero minus X one zero sine bar alpha X two sine beta X one. So that's what it is. And so any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What we can do now is we can write this as ditto. Now we write this as sine plus beta X one sine bar minus alpha X two minus beta and so forth. Sine bar alpha plus X two sine minus beta X one. And now we replace the product by we could replace it by the commutator or the anti-commutator. We replace it by the commutator. We get a mess. We replace it by the anti-commutator. We get something neat. And so we just do this. And and then to see what this is. Well, sine beta plus X one anti-commutator with sine bar minus alpha X two is integral to Q G Q Q Q pi to the six root two E P two E Q. Um, some I'm going to call these S and T rather than S and S prime. Anti-commutator A P S U P beta S E minus I P X one A dagger Q T U bar C Q no T T alpha of Q E T I Q X two anti-commutator. Well, the anti-commutator of those is two pi Q delta S T delta Q P minus Q. And so altogether, this is just integral T Q P two pi Q two P zero E minus I P X one minus X two. And then a sum on S 
U of P beta S bar P S alpha. And we know that sum, that's the U U bar that we did a couple of days ago. And so this is an integral D Q P I Q 2 P 0 minus I P X 1 minus S 2. And this is P squared plus M beta alpha. Okay. And now if we do the same thing for the other term, in other words, we have what we've just done is this one. So now we have to do this one. And so we can say psi bar plus alpha of X 2 psi beta minus of X 1. Well, this of course is also the same thing since it's an anti-commutator as psi minus beta of X 1 minus psi alpha bar plus of X 2. And so this is again, let me just write this as D Q P D Q Q. And we've got these various factors, sum on S and T. Then we have the anti-commutator P dagger of P and S. V of P of beta S E to the I P X 1. P of Q T V bar T alpha of Q T minus I P X 2. All right, once again, it kicks out for delta S T delta Q P minus Q. And T pi Q, so we wind up with T Q P T pi Q Q P 0 sum on S V beta S V bar S alpha of P E to the minus I P X 2 minus X 1 in this case. And that's V V bar, and we know that's D Q P T pi Q Q P 0. And so it's P slash minus M beta alpha minus I X 2 minus X 1. All right, now we can write this as a derivative. And the derivative, we have an X 1 and an X 2. We're going to apply convention to go with X 1. So we're differentiating with respect to X 1. And let me just remind you what that derivative is. P slash is going to be D A gamma A, which is partial, partial X upper A gamma A. And so in particular, this one can be, let me make sure I've got everything right. Okay. This can be written then as I D slash plus M beta alpha on the integral. And the integral is just delta plus of X 1 minus X 2. On the other hand, this one can then be written as, well, there are two tricks here. One is that X 1 has a minus sign here. X 1 has a plus sign here. And so, and there's a minus sign here. So the extra, the plus sign here instead of the minus sign means it's effectively the minus sign there. And so this turns out to be minus I D slash plus M beta alpha delta plus of X 2 minus X 1. 
where again, the derivative is with respect to x1. Okay, so that means that what has to be thrown away as s of f, x1 minus x2 plus x beta alpha, which is zero time order product side beta x1 times y. Okay, x2 is then beta of x1, zero minus x2, zero. I, b slash plus m beta alpha plus x1 minus x2 plus beta x2 minus x1, zero. I, b slash plus m beta alpha plus x2 minus x1. Now, hold on, let's hold the phone just a second here. There's a minus sign here that was built in that I went through a lot to emphasize. That minus sign occurs here. Yes, so kindly for pointing out. That's why we get a plus sign. All right, now, what we're going to do, and of course this is job. So now what we want to do is we want to write this as I, b slash plus m beta alpha acting on something. Namely, acting on beta x1, zero minus x2, zero. Delta plus of x1 minus x2 plus beta x2, zero minus x1, zero. Delta plus of x2 minus x1. Well, that's fine for the spatial derivatives and for the mass term. But the time derivative is going to cause some embarrassment when it comes to theta functions. Uh, so we have to put in a term that cancels that. The term that cancels that is minus i d0 gamma 0 theta of x1 0 minus x2 0 delta plus of x1 minus x2 minus i d0 gamma 0 theta x2 0 minus x1 0 delta plus of x2 minus x1. Okay, so now we cancel Cancel the two, and of course, beta alpha is the substitute. So now, um, now we cancel the the the, the uh, effect of the time derivative on the beta. And the reason it's bad is because what this function looks like. It's got this vertical line. And stuff. Well, we have to we have to put in. We have to cancel, I mean, whatever theta was, we'd always have to cancel this. But we have to cancel only the time derivative, though, because this is only a function of time. Oh, I see, because we took this, yeah. Do you need another trunk? No. Yeah. Okay, now. Now, though, we use the property of the theta function, which is to say the theta function looks like this, and so, d by the x1, 0 of theta x1, 0 minus x2, 0 is delta function x1, 0 minus x2, 0. And of course, once again, it's direct across the delta function. Um, over here, we're differentiating, but the argument is, 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 is the negative of the other argument, so we get minus the delta function. The result is that this extra term 
By the way, this thing here is just Feynman's uh, delta F. Well, what whose is called the delta F? So let me rewrite this. This, in other words, is I d slash cross M beta alpha times minus I delta sub F of X1 minus X2. So that's, that's the term that we want to keep. And then there's this term, which is minus I gamma zero beta alpha delta x one zero minus x two zero. But now what we get is delta plus of x one minus x two minus delta plus of x two minus x one. Well, what we saw some time ago was that delta plus doesn't care much about its argument when the two points are space -like. In particular, delta plus of x is equal to delta plus of minus x if x is space -like. All right, let's, let's, let's prove that. That's because delta plus of x is is EQP by Q to P zero E to the minus on P X. And let's write this minus I P X. Okay. Now if X is space like then we can rewrite this as DQP. This thing is in, invariant, so we can write it as DQP 2P0 prime E to the minus I P prime X prime, where we Lorentz transform both X and P but to a frame where X0 prime is zero, because X is space-like. You can notice it. In such a frame, this is then P cubed P prime to P prime zero E to the now in pest controller this is I P prime dot X prime. But now this only depends this is just a you know P squared E P D omega. This just involves P squared. So we can replace P by my, uh, P prime by minus P prime to three vector. We put in a minus sign there. Now we transform back to the original frame and we get uh, DQP P0 e to the minus R, well, plus I PX, and this is then delta plus minus I. So delta plus of X, delta plus of minus X, the next space like that the same. So this term is zero because not only is it space like, but it's equal time. So it's necessarily space like. So this whole term then is zero. And what's left is then um, minus i e slash plus m uh, acting on delta f of x1 minus x2. Now if we remember what that is, that is there was in delta in, in delta f there was a certain minus sign, so this thing is equal to i i d slash plus n. I think we're left in false and i. I d slash and ah, there it is. I d slash. Beta alpha on integral minus i k x1 minus x2 k squared minus n squared plus i f1 t four k over to four. And now we move this thing through, keeping the metrics and the minus signs and everything straight. What we get is e minus i k 
1 minus x2 i k slash plus m k to alpha over k squared minus m squared plus i x1 t toward k and this is 3.121 in PMS which fortunately doesn't have a typo in it. So can I ask what happened to the minus sign in front of the it's that yes you can answer it's that when we express minus i delta f minus i delta f is minus this remember Heston and Shorter never used delta f they just used anyway whatever they used ok so now we've got our expression for the Feynman propagator for fermions and it is of course sf of x1 minus x2 is the mean value in the vacuum of this time order product with the built in minus sign in the time order product so we then take this thing and stick it inside our expressions here for s2 and s1 and because of the lateness of the hour and because of the fact that the notes are on the line I'm just going to try to do this somewhat quickly so this means that s1 is minus g squared integral u bar of p1 prime s1 prime beta we get rid of this three e to the minus i k x1 minus x2 i k slash plus m k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon beta alpha notice the beta 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 alpha e fourth k pi to the fourth and now this is u of p1 I wrote it as s1 alpha but I should have written it as alpha s1 and then the phase factors are e to the i x1 p1 prime plus p2 prime minus i x2 p1 plus p2 d4 of x1 d4 of x2 well the d4 of x is are very easy to do once again direct to the rescue we have the coefficient of we have e to the minus i x1 k minus p1 prime minus p2 prime or if we do the x2 integration it's k minus p1 minus p2 times delta pi to the fourth and that means that k has to be p1 plus p2 and so if I may skip one step we get minus g squared doing the k integration u bar s1 prime beta p1 prime we now have e to the minus i p1 plus p2 k x2 is gone i p1 slash plus p2 slash plus m beta alpha we still have the d no we don't have any d k that's gone and the 2 pi to the 4th is gone u alpha s1 of p1 and then e to the i x1 p1 prime plus p2 prime d4 x1 is there anything left? yes of course it's p1 plus p2 squared minus m squared and from experience we know we don't need a i x1 so now the d4th 
X integration just gives us overall conservation of uh, energy momentum. And um, so all together then, X1 is um, minus G squared to pi to the four. Let's see, why do I have so many? Well, let me write the final form for this. I have four. Delta the fourth of um, one plus two, two minus two minus one minus two, two prime. And then it's simply um, E bar um, plus P one prime uh, S one prime uh, let's see, S one prime beta. And then I one slash plus two slash plus n over one plus p two squared minus n squared. And let me leave the rest of this sort of like this and put the rest u of uh, p one, and it is alpha. S one. All right, and this is beta alpha. Okay, so that's that term. I'm just trying to save board space. Um, the S two term. Well, all you do is you take your formula. You do the exact same thing. You take the formula for the Dirac propagator and you stick it into the formula for S for S two over there, and I think I'll just tell you what the answer is. It's plus I P1 slash minus P2 prime slash plus M beta alpha over P1 minus P2 prime squared minus M squared. So that's the final answer of total S. And this one here, of course, is the diagram. So when you use the Feynman rules, what you do is you just write down, for this term, you write down the diagram. And for this term, you write down the diagram. Well, you have to put the arrows in. But the diagram um, And so this is P1, this is P2. You see this propagator then carries momentum P1 plus P2. This one is P1, P2 prime. So this is P1 minus P2 prime. And this is P2, P1 prime. Okay, so this is, so when when you're, I mean, if you do a lot of these diagrams, then you, you know, you learn the Feynman rules and you start applying them, and you just say this goes to that, this goes to that, this goes to this, and um, I think one day maybe I'll tell you. Well, after I get the Fermi, after I get the photon propagator, I'll um, review the Feynman rules, state the Feynman rules. So if you want to just use them. without going through the derivation. Can I think of the, the U bar and the U as enforcing some kind of selection rule and that scattering to certain spin states is going to be disallowed? Well, yeah, sure. Um, if, um, in fact, if you were dealing with weak interactions here, um, there would have been essentially a one plus or minus gamma five, depending on your metric and convention. And that would project out the right-handed fields. And so for the, um, at least the flavor of the charge current weak directions, you check that thing out. It's one of the startling things actually about the standard model, um, which is that Parity is not simply broken, but it's 
destroyed. I mean, it's annihilated. It's totally broken as far as we know in these in the SU-2 left interaction. And that probably means, by the way, that the seesaw mechanism really is right and that the neutrino, in other words, the left-handed field doesn't, the left-handed neutrino doesn't, in fact, the left-handed electron doesn't participate, or the left-handed quarks and leptons, let's say, those fields don't participate in the SU-2 part of the weak interactions. And so that probably means that since they're just gone, it probably means probably big, heavy air quotes, means that the right-handed fields have been, in a sense, well, it's consistent. I mean, in other words, the thing that's breaking it is really, it's breaking parity, it's really thrashing it. So it's not surprising to say that the mass terms for the right-handed field, the Majorana terms for the right-handed field, are way up there at extraordinarily high masses. All right, anyway, the reason why I went off on that tangent about neutrinos is that we had such a nice colloquium on Friday. I hope everybody went to it. It was one of the best colloquia of ever, I would say, if you want to know. One of the best physics colloquia ever. And so I thought what I would do, it would just, in as much as we've just been talking about propagators, I'd, in fact, talk about the neutrino oscillations and this phase factor that, in fact, is sort of done wrong in the textbook for this course. So I'll give you my look at it. So let's just see what's actually happening. You've got to say, in a particular case, you've got a U quark turning into a D quark. And out comes a W plus, which turns into a positron in this particular case. And then some news coming across. And then this can turn into a D or mu or, in general, a tor. Another W, in fact, W plus. And then this turns into a U and a D comes along. Now, the charge of the U is two-thirds. The charge of the D is minus one-third. So the charge is conserved in this way. And, OK. Now, the funny thing about this, and I don't want to go through all of the detail here, but it's that this new E is, let us say, A mu one plus B mu two plus C mu three. Or, if we write this as a flavor matrix, nu fi is equal to, say, U i j nu m j. In other words, the mass eigenstates are over here. This is a unitary matrix, three by three, at least for the light fields. Remember the, well, the electron, of course, what this looks like is this. There's a doublet, nu E. And this is the Dirac field for the neutrino, Dirac field for the electron. And only a left-handed part of this participates in an SU2 left, two by two transformation. That's the symmetry of the theory. That's one of the symmetries. There's another symmetry. 
this is the one I'm focusing on. So you want to see our the mass eigenstates? Um, it's, it's the flavor eigenstates here. No, the in, in other words, in the interaction, you have the flavor eigenstates. Is that yeah, the, the new E is the flavor eigenstate, but new one, two, three is, is the mass eigenstate. Right. Yeah, E yeah. is flavor yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody want chocolate? You guys are chocolate now. I hope you guys brush your teeth. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. What I'm going to do is sort of um, the mystic of now. The new <coughs> perturbation theory, which is what we've been doing, the you write the Hamiltonian in terms of you write the quadratic part of the Hamiltonian in terms of its normal modes or its normal fields. And these are the mass eigenstates. So the things that occur in this propagator are the mass eigenstates. So when you have an electron field here, you or a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino, you write it in terms of its three mass eigenstates. Now, in general, if this were happening in just one interaction, you know, if, it, if, if, if we were trying to do UD scattering this way, well, of course, this is a very small contribution to UD scattering because UD scattering goes through gluons first, and secondly, it would go through photons. And so when, when you have two Ws involved, you're down by, as Fuller said, the mean tree path of a, an MEV neutrino is light years away. So, what I'm thinking of here is that this whole region here takes place, say, in the sun or in a nuclear reactor or in, a, uh, in an accelerator. And this process here takes place in a detector somewhere. All right. And so, I'm going to be thinking about this Feynman diagram, and of course, when we write this Feynman diagram, you know, I'd have eight or ten D fourth X's, and it would be a nightmare. So I'm just going to sort of cut this off and say that this one I think is coming in with probably K1, and this one is going out with K2. And in fact, I'm going to be saying that this region of space time is before the other region, I'm going to ignore the opposite time order because the, all the, folk, the neutrinos come from the sun and the earth is on the other way about. It's this ambiguity of which is of, of time ordering occurs because you're talking about processes that are microscopic in space and time, and so you don't know which is which. But here we do. And so this vacuum, and also in order to keep the notation simple, we've only got you know, 10 minutes left, I'm going to ignore spin one half, I'm going to ignore the one minus gamma five, I'm going to ignore everything, I'm going to almost treat things as simply as possible. And so we have psi x1, psi dagger, I'm imagining these are spinless fields, in other words, just to make it simple. And so I'm first of all replacing this by Delta plus of x1 minus x2, I'm leaving out the other term, backwards time order, and you remember, of course, the delta plus of x is integral e to p, p0, e to the minus sign p, x over, um, well, anyway, um, so this thing, this amplitude here is essentially this. Um, d cubed x1, d cubed x2, e to the minus, uh, e to the minus x2 minus y2 squared over 2 sigma squared. Sigma is just some length that characterizes the production region. 
and why to characterizes the center of the production region. And then minus x1 minus y1 squared over 2 sigma squared. And then minus ip x2 minus x1. That's this thing. I'm, in other words, I'm calling this x2 and this x1 and uh, this, well, this one actually is k2 and this is uh, k1. So what are these, these Gaussian factors? Are yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And this, this other Gaussian, this, this Gaussian uh, limits the interaction to the detector region. Okay, okay. It's as if I multiplied the interacting Hamiltonian by a Gaussian. We've said the detection and the Okay, and this is all going to be. All right, then we've got these other factors which are e to the minus i, k2, x2 minus i, k1, x1 plus i, p2, x2 plus i, p1, x1. And then there's some function of time, x1, 0, x2, 0, p1, x0, dx, 2, 0. And I'm, I'm, I don't know what to use for x1, x2. And this isn't being any quote as far as I know. Um, notice we've got, of course, p times x2 minus x1 is p0, x2, 0 minus x1, 0 minus p dot x2 minus x1. That's the metric. Now, what you've got here effectively is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. And let me just write down once the formula d cubed x1 e to the minus x1 minus y1 squared over 2 sigma squared minus i x1. The coefficient of x1 is going to be d plus p1 minus k1. And just to get the normalization right, we've got a sigma root 2 pi cubed, which I forgot for the year. So this is sigma root 2 pi is 6. <coughs> and this Fourier transform is just e to the minus i y1 p plus p1 minus k1 minus the half sigma squared p plus p1 minus k. So you notice what this is. This this thing, when sigma is really big, and when right, when sigma is really big, then the production region is big enough so that uh, the uh, uncertainty in momentum energy is very small. In that case, the big sigma, we're forcing k to be p plus k1, which is which which is um, we're for, we're not forcing it. In the delta function sense, but we're pushing it sort of toward that value. And the same thing happens for the other uh, integral. Anyway, when, you, when you've done those two, what you wind up with is dqp over 2 pi q 2p0, this f dx10, dx20. And, oh, what I should have mentioned here is these are three vectors. Okay, remember, the, it was the three dimensional Fourier transform. So what's left is that the three vector of P is, is forced to be K minus P1. And the, the analogous factor. Anyway, what is what isn't what's, what's left over is minus i p zero x two zero minus x one zero, and then there are all sorts of factors that are faded. Well, maybe I should just write them down. So this is the one I want to focus on. But there's also minus i y one dot p plus p one minus k1 minus a half sigma squared p plus p1 minus k1 squared.
squared, then this p to the minus i, y p dot p2 minus p minus k minus a half sigma squared, then p2 minus p minus k2 squared. There's this term that's important, and then there is e to the minus i, k2 zero, x2 zero, minus i, k1 zero, x1 zero, plus i, k2 zero, x2 zero, plus i, k1 zero, x1 zero. All right. These things, of course, we have to integrate over k1 and k2, and we might integrate over p1 and p2 and so forth. But the thing I want to focus on is this. And notice we've been doing the property, we've been doing this delta plus here for one particular mass I, you say. And so this thing is e to the minus i. Now, what is x2 minus x1? Well, in natural units, well, of course, it's the time delay to go from production to detection, but that's the, the distance. So this thing is e to the i l times the energy, the energy being p squared, p being constrained, plus n squared. And so this is going to be e to the minus i l p times the square root of 1 plus m squared over p squared. And so this is e to the minus i l p times e to the minus i l m squared over 2p, expanding and only keeping the first term of the square root. So each of these propagators is going to get, you're going to get A, this phase factor for M1, B, the phase factor for M2, C, the phase factor for M3. And so these, these, these phase factors, delta C, are L, if, if, there were just, if, if we just do two mass eigenstates as opposed to three to make it simple, then the phase, relative phase between the two mass eigenstates going across is going to be L delta M squared over 2P. And of course, P and E are the same for neutrinos because these neutrinos have sub-MEV energies, sub-MEV masses, sub-EV masses and MEV or higher energies. So when you see that make the mixing matrix that people write, are these the entries in that matrix? Or what are the entries in that matrix? The entries in the mixing matrix are these guys. Okay. And these are That's a three by three complex matrix. Are these somehow related to these phases? No, these are not related to the phases. Um, these it's it's the you you it's the the delta m squares are related to the are related to the u's. Um, let me see. Let me say this straight. Let's put it this way: If you knew what the masses were, then you compute the phase differences this way, and you see if this thing starts out. Suppose it starts out like this. Suppose nu e, to, to, to make things simple, suppose nu e is, um, well, we're over root to nu 1 plus i nu 2. Okay, just to make it simple. All right. Now, suppose as time goes by, when it crosses this distance l, you get an overall phase and then a difference in phase. Suppose the difference in phase was 180 degrees, so a relative minus sign here. Well, then this thing would be 1 over root 2, nu 1 minus i nu 2, apart from an overall phase. But this is what we call nu mu, because it's the, it's the one that's orthogonal to nu e. 
So by the time the mass eigenstates get to the detector, the, the relative phase has changed the new E into a new mu. And so what we get here then is a mu one. And uh, in the case of atmospheric neutrinos, for example, there I think that there are more mu neutrinos produced in the well let's see, I haven't looked at these terms in a while, so I I don't want to say things uh, incorrectly. But you've got enough distance and the mass difference is enough so that you get an appreciable shift in mu one to electron going from um, the interaction is 10 kilometers in the sky and the ground. But then the, these neutrinos don't, the Earth has no effect at all. So what you have to do is you have to integrate over the whole atmosphere of the planet. And um, in fact, you must have to integrate over the whole planet because the neutrino can interact anywhere in the planet. So, uh, well, it depends on what the primary is. If the primary is not a, a charge left on the proton, then the interaction can. All right, well, I try. Is, is there, are there any questions about this? Because I'm, I, I certainly, obviously, my presentation of the neutrino stuff has been somewhat um, stream of consciousness. Uh, so, um, I might have forgotten. I might have so probably forgot to say several things. So, does anybody have any questions? Uh, all right. Well, next time I'll try to get uh, this uh, the, the the rest of the business about photons. I'll say something about the little group of photons. Something about. Um, Remind you of the quantization and the Coulomb gauge, and then work out the propagator and the Coulomb gauge, and then I'll wave my hands to the effect of how it is that one can um, go from uh, well, if, if one considers the instantaneous Coulomb term with the you know rho of x rho of y over x minus y together with the Coulomb propagator, if you take the two together. They give you just eight of you knew over Q squared plus I epsilon and minus epsilon. All right. And I guess I should put a homework assignment on the web page. I'll try to do that um, sometime before Monday. I, I'm not sure. I'm doing my. Email.